Yeah, sorry for all the detail and the, uh, those, yeah, I've got to learn to clean up my language and say birds rather than avian, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's a bad habit. Uh, and I think I only went, what, 10 minutes over? <laughs> sorry about 10 that. 10 valuable minutes in our lives, I would say. Um, thank you so much, David, for bringing, yes. bringing all this information well, to us. We so appreciate it. I, thank, thank you for bearing with my weird, detail, geeky stuff. And thank you so much be, for, so that I can come somewhere and not get heckled. It's great. Quite a change. <laughs> and um, Cynthia is going to... SprayCalifornia.org, and if we want to give David some gas money, we've got a few expenses for tonight. We want to pay our sound person, so I'm just going to pass around these two hats, or these, this bowl and this hat, and uh, while we're there going, I'm going to ask a couple of our local folks just to make some announcements that'll work in with, I mean, since everything is connected in this community, Coming up, whoever else was going to make some announcements. They were um, before we go into the real discussion period. There, uh, there are a couple of things. I just wanted to show like a local thing of like what to look out for. Um, here's from oh July 9th. Mosquito activity raises West Nile virus concerns. Right? You can go to our website, look at the the mosquito section, and you'll find out that this is just another one of those programs, like the light brown apple moth, like the gypsy moth, like the glass wing sharpshooter the MedFly, and all these kinds of programs that, that David's been talking about. They operate by the same people, the pesticide industry, scaring people and getting the money to funnel down. Um, so that's, that's one thing to think about. I wanted to also ask just, we, we wanted to have really short statements by a few of the people who have been very involved in this whole Hills process and then launch into dis discussion. But um, oh. So, so why don't we do that? One quick point that, remember the MedFly spraying, the helicopter company that was doing it was owned by the CIA and they were training pilots for use in Central, in the Central American conflict at the time. I was, um, that's what's probably triggered um, a lot of my health problems. I know I look very healthy, thankfully I am in many ways. I'm also very, very ill um, in many ways and related to the MedFly spraying in LA. Um, in the in the early 80s, uh, doctors thought I had leukemia. They prepared my family for my apparently imminent death. I've now had more decades, but with a lot of um, a lot of chronic health problems. In, and so, the MedFly program, which I will say is alive and well still, all that spraying all over the state, that program has not stopped. Um, so, I wanted to ask if um, Connie Barker would please come up quickly to speak. Um, Connie Barker of the Environmental Health Network. Uh, many of us with multiple chemical sensitivity and many related um, diseases and problems um, have been involved in various ways and have had the help of it, um, the Environmental Health Network for uh, decades. One of our early members who's from the Environmental Health Network, Barb Wilkie, uh, is no longer alive. Yesterday we were at a memorial for another person with MCS who recently died. It's real. Your best website is Don't Spray California. Don't Spray California.org or East Bay Pesticide Alert.org. It's the same website. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, he, he mostly said it all. About all that I can add is, you know, this has been going on for a very long time. And um, our organization, EHN, was spun off of an older organization that came into existence because of the MedFly spraying, because so many people were chemically injured in that. Um, it was a statewide organization. We broke off in the Bay Area back around 1988 to try and do um, housing for chemically injured people up in Marin, and we got that housing, Ecology House. Uh, and we've seen, I, I mean, I, I, I was looking on the list of things for Scotch Broom, because that's what we deal with up in Marin. They're forever trying to get the Scotch Broom off of Mount Tamalpais, and we're forever trying to stop them. And we, you know, it takes ungodly amounts of our time and energy to, you know. Uh, and, and, but, but this that, that he's talking about tonight, 
it, you know, coming against the very idea of this invasion biology is where we have to take this. Because I, I, I just, I, I, I could not overstate to you the amount of our time and energy as activists for the last like 20 years that I've been aware of that has gone into trying to come up with alternative programs to get rid of these invaders to try and stop them from using the pesticides. I, I was get very good friends with another one of our activists who is recently deceased. Her name was Janet Dobble. She ran a nationwide support group for believe it or not, you know, fundamentalist type Christians who were chemically injured. Uh, and who have the same problems that I have and who I became friends with as, as part of that. Where she lived in Fraser Park in the mountains outside LA, she organized huge numbers of people to pull some of those species by hand just so that they wouldn't get sprayed. Think about how much time and energy something like that takes that then doesn't go into everything else that we need to do. So, sometimes we end up just fighting the wrong battles you know, uh, about this, uh, but because yes, we don't want to be sprayed, but we have to ask that more fundamental question. We, we have to ask this question about these so-called invaders. And I can tell you from having fought a lot of these battles that, that the way it comes down over and over again is by the first time we get the first public notice that something like this is going to go on, they've already got the big environmental groups on their side. They've already talked, been talking to the local native plant people for quite a while. They have already been talking usually to the fire protection district because usually, you know, that they've found that that is a meme that works really effectively with people. And so it's that the, the whole thing has like already been prepared and or, or is all ready for rollout and then we found out about it and bang, we have to, you know, we're in total response mode as we often are. From my point of view, the way to get off of that losing treadmill is to, is to take it from the point of view that this man is talking about. We have to start questioning the underlying assumption here that these are invasive species that we have to, to do something about. We have to start looking at this and we have to start calling it the lie that it is. Because in every one of these battles that I'm talking about, you know, Monsanto and these other people, Dow Chemical, were right there funding it from the get-go. If you think that even one of these would exist, if they hadn't found a way to set you know, some sort of eradication that it, it's very like the pharmaceutical industries. You know, they're not going to sell you something that's going to make you better and then you never need to take it again. You know, they are only going to sell it to you if you need to keep using it over and over and over. And you will not find one of these eradication programs where, where they're going to eradicate it and it's going to be done. Oh, no, no. There's going to have to be decades of painting those stumps with Roundup. If it weren't for that, they wouldn't be pushing it at all. None of this would exist. And, and, and you really have to get a handle on that to know what's going on. So, you know, I mean, from my point of view, and, and again, what, what we saw them doing this in the, how many years ago was it in, in the East Bay Hills what, where we were fighting them, the, the fire district? Yeah, and, 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 and as I said, with the, Scot with the Scotch broom on Mount Tam, we've been doing it for all the years that I've been in Marin, and that's 18 years, and, and it goes on and on and on. You know, we, we had them, for, for a while, we were trying to get them to use goats and things, you know, because, because again, we were buying into it, and, and it was a real eye-opening moment for me when, when I, you know, first heard the people here a few years ago and said, yeah, you know, I've known in my gut that this was not the right battle, but now I know why it's not the right battle. So, all right. What? Yeah, so I wanted to um, call up Earth First. I had emailed Steve. He, I hadn't heard back from him, and then I talked with Maeve. Whomever wants to come up, I am formerly, well, still from, was very involved with Earth First in the 80s. And we'll say that I, it was in those circles that I started hearing about the problem with eucalyptus. And I've really reflected on that over time, um, thinking, wow, a lot of us just kind of accepted that, as is continuing to happen now. But I want to know who actually started that mill, that rumor mill, within Earth First. So um, I've been reflecting now for decades <laughs> on that question. Um, so anybody from Steve, Maeve, did you want to come? And then we're going to have, very soon after this, we're going to have a discussion among everybody. We just wanted to, yeah. just real quick. Which if, 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 huh? which rumor? Oh, around eucalyptus being 
wildfire danger. Yeah. Well, first oh. of all, thanks for all coming. Oh, you're, you're all coming. Um, I'll just be brief. Okay. Yeah, my name's Steve, and I've been an Earth Firster since um, the late 80s. But <clears throat> I'm really happy to see some incredible activists here. Uh, number one is Air. Air was a great Earth Firster uh, for many years, and he was the, the, one of the main leaders to save the oak trees up at UC Berkeley uh, Stadium, and he should say a few words. Uh, Maeve, great Earth Firster. Uh, and Gail, back there, she was one of the first. Gail, she's back there in the red. Anyway, also, Ayer was a leader of the Occupy movement. Now, th this is going to require, I mean, all kinds of um, um, actions, nonviolent actions, um, but uh, in direct actions, and Air is very, very experienced at that, and so are many other people here. And uh, <clears throat> we need almost like a uh, an Occupy movement. Ocu we need to occupy the forest, uh, which it comes down to. And, and it took us like over 20 years to save about 8,000 acres of redwoods. And our actions, many of our actions required, we had 50 people living in trees. You probably all heard of Julia Butterfly, but there were 49 others over the years that lived in trees. And they had people supporting them and what, you know, things like that. We uh, locked down blockaded roads. Um, we had actions in the city here, all kinds of support groups. Karen Pickett is an awesome Earth Firster and I'm sure she would join this cause more than anyone. Uh, Cynthia Johnson, there's so many great activists right here that can organize and around this issue, and uh, I'm so thankful they're here, and um, the trees are our brothers and our sisters. <laughs> so I, I invite Air or whoever else wants to maybe say a few words, and uh, thanks for all coming. And we can do this. We have the, the people, we have the determination, and we have the experience. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a discussion right after, very shortly here. I wanted to bring up one more person to make kind of a, a statement, so to speak. Um, this is Marg uh, representing Quido, a disability rights organization um, also. And... Um, they wrote a beautiful statement that you'll actually find in that packet. There are a few of those packets left. Um, please take them and actually work with them. Don't just leave them on a shelf. Use them to get the facts, the ideas for writing your own letters and sharing information with your friends and your family and, and your communities. Thank you. So, um, Cuido Communities United in Defense of Olmstead. We mostly have been working for the rights of people with disabilities to live fully in our communities. Mostly in recent years, the last three years, have been fighting the state budget cuts. But we also understand that uh, folks that have chemical injuries are experiencing increasing amounts of isolation and marginalization and exclusion. And we intend to fight this plan as an issue both of disability rights and also because we love the earth. We're environmentalists. So what do we do mostly? Um, we engage in direct action, nonviolent direct action. So if you're interested in leafleting, vigils, street theater, wheat pasting, occupations, sit-ins, or blockades, um, we'd love you to join us. So our, we have postcards over on that table. I suppose we should get together with the Earth Firsters, too. Um, so if you want to find out more about who we are and how to contact us, you can get this postcard over there. Thanks. One last thing I want to say here before we launch into the discussion is that it's not just the hills, per se, here, and it's not just Mount Sutro. These uh, programs are happening all over the place um, in little and smaller versions. We've been fighting to save the um, eucalyptus in San Leandro Creek, the county has planned to get rid of all the eucalyptus that was planted over 100 years all along San Leandro Creek. The wildlife corridor that allows 
um, <clears throat> movement of wildlife, um, you know, terrestrial wildlife between the creek and the hills. Um, and if you can believe it, uh, Gene Kwan is behind a whole lot of this, Gene Kwan et al. Uh, Gene Kwan has been pushing these native plant restoration projects that's what they're calling them around San Leandro Creek. She also has been pushing to get rid of all the nearly 100-year-old redwoods uh, in Diamond Park in the Fruitvale, another native plant restoration project. Isn't that interesting? This is the first time I've heard anybody um, doing a native plant restoration project as they're calling it, but removing redwoods. <laughs> so... It gets a little bit weirder and weirder as you get into it, but these projects are all over the place. Tiburon, all over. What we wanted to do here is have people understand how connected they are. They're not separate projects. They're all of a pesticide industry back movement. We all know great people who've gotten involved in the native plant restoration movement. We all, I'm sure we all do, right? People who mean well um, and I would say have been misguided by a larger industry. So it always gets difficult and dicey, and I cannot explain to you how unhinged some people have gotten in the midst of some of us who do organizing. I mean unhinged, there's not a better word to use. So, you know, please again, take that information, the factual information, and work with it, think about it, and figure out how to be, you know, working with this information with friends, family, community. Um, so David is here to be able to answer questions and we want to make sure that people feel like you can really just have a discussion, bring up your thoughts here, because we do want want to see how we can feed into people working together to stop these programs, actually working together. Um, uh, so people can line up over here um, in order to speak. About organizing, uh, there was the, the gal who was talking about, uh, you know, working with fundamentalist Christians. We've got to get past this, these political things that divide us. I have very close, dear friends who are straight up rednecks. Uh, we disagree politically on a lot of things, but we agree on a lot of things too. It's like the whole Occupy and Tea Party thing. If those groups could get together and just set aside the things they differ on and work together on the things they agree on, we could really, really make a difference. Um, and oh yeah, about this, this isn't just the, the eucalyptus here, this is worldwide. I could tell you stories about this happening in New Zealand and Australia, India, China, Europe, Africa, it's everywhere. So anyway. So I'm very interested in the trees in the Bay Area staying where they are. I have a few questions. Uh, one of them is, how did this native, how and when did this native Nazi movement get started? What is their perfect year that they are trying to replicate and maintain as though you can keep anything static in the world? And how were the eucalyptus introduced in the Bay Area? And what was the landscape like before they were introduced? And then the other thing is, a Muir loved, Muir loved eucalyptus, right? Didn't he bring like 20 species onto his farm? Oh, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, he's, yeah. yeah. But anyway, if you could answer any of those, I would be wow. very grateful. Wow, yeah, that's grateful. Quite, quite a list. You'll have to refresh my memory. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> the perfect year. Okay, the perfect year uh, here in the Americas seems to be 1491, right? <laughs> Bef just before Columbus, uh, when actually... Uh, the American Indians moved a lot of species over long distances. They had long trade routes. They traded seeds, medicinal plants. They planted things. They moved animals. I believe they even took the uh, California gray fox out to the Channel Islands in their canoes. Uh, Who decided this 1491? Where did, the, where did the germ of this whole thing get started? Uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's... It's like the, the ideology builds on itself. Once you decide, well, I like nature, then you look around and you go, wow, there's these native plants and animals, so I like them. And then it's like, well, then what's native? Then you go back and you say 1491 was the dividing line after the uh, European conquest. Although I always like to point out that the conquest of the Americas started long before Columbus. 
because uh, the Aztecs were a, an imperialistic empire built on the backs of slaves. Talk to the Apache. They remember, they say, ah, those dirty Aztecs used to raid our village for slaves to work their mines. There were the Incas, the Mayas. Imperialism cuts across all boundaries. It's, it's just a phenomenon we have to deal with. Let's see, what were some so of the other questions? So what was the questions? landscape like before the eucalyptus were introduced and how were they introduced? Uh, let's see, I believe they were introduced in, uh, during the gold mining era. They wanted to have uh, mine props. And uh, yeah, there's a great website. I, it, I think it was a guy named Santos uh, up in, uh, maybe it was, uh, Anyway, Northern California somewhere, uh, he did, there's a website about the history of eucalyptus in California. It's very detailed. Uh, it's, he, I, I would have to defer to his expertise. Um, uh, what did the landscape look like before they were introduced? Uh, okay, if you go back before the uh, colonization by the missions, uh, there's a lot of, you know, we don't, there's a lot that we don't, no, and a lot that we do know, but if you read the, uh, the early explorers' accounts, those are very educational. Because uh, the, the Indians modified the landscape tremendously. They did a lot of burning uh, to control, say, like the oak moths. Uh, they dug bulbs. In fact, uh, a gal I've worked with in the past, works. she's a, a biologist for the uh, uh, California Indian Basket Weavers Association, and they're also fighting herbicides and wildlands because they go out and pick plants for their basketry and uh, you know they'll be stripping the bark off of roots with their teeth and they're worried about herbicide exposure. And uh, uh, Vivian Parker is her name. She uh, worked for the basket weavers and she was telling me that uh, she had been, you know, as a college-trained uh, botanist, she was taught about these invasive, invasives are bad. But then she, when she was out in the field with these little old Indian grandmas who were, you know, showing her basket plants, and she would say, oh, these, you know, Vivian would say, oh, well, gee, we got to get rid of these thistles. They're bad. And the, these uh, little old Indian grandmas would go, oh, no, those thistles are good. You can use them for this, and you can use them for that. So... Uh, so the, the, these, the native plant people, they don't want to get rid of the other things like we who are invaders or our buildings or right. they don't want to get rid of any of that, right. right? Now, you know, I really, I mean, since I was born here, I love native plants. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of work with them. Uh, it's like I, I can sympathize with how they feel, but, uh, you know, a lot of times I, I suspect that this is a, People, okay, you know about what a scapegoat was. It was back in the old days in the Middle East, a tribe would, once a year, they would like heap all of the sins of the tribe onto a goat and then drive it into the wilderness to get rid of their sin. And so now we're, we're accusing these invasive plants of everything that our ancestors have done. So we're trying to extirpate our guilt. And another thing I've noticed uh, I'd like to see it studied is that a lot of times the most vehement native plant people are people that aren't from here. Because you know, you know how it is here in California, the first thing you ask people is, well, where are you from? <laughs> and you know, people like me who were born here, actually people born in California have been outnumbered by immigrants continuously since records began to be kept. We should really so, all go. Pardon? We should really all go. <laughs> well, I would hate to, I would hate to see you all go. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, as a native California, I've I've welcomed all these immigrants. They're great. I mean, I remember I could walk around my old hometown, Redwood City, and go, oh, I can buy stuff at the Iranian delicatessen. I can, you know. I'm gonna step back. Okay, I, you know, I could, we could talk for it, a very great. long time. So. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it just it, it's wonderful going to ask anybody who speaks to try to hold the microphone pretty close to your mouth is uncomfortable just so that it gets heard. Hi, I'm Bev and I was just going to say I loved hearing your talk. I really oh. agree. I'm the person that would take broom seeds and disperse them <laughs> at certain areas that I thought there's nothing else there and they bloom yellow in the winter. They smell delicious and I just knew the native animals were using them. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that I don't think anybody that is not native to the continent and I don't even mean people that grew up here, um, have any right to say anything about 
any, killing any plant, any tree, any animal. I love the wild boar. And um, the people that do want to kill the animals or the plants should start with their own yards, get rid of the vegetable gardens, get rid of their herb gardens, cut down all the street trees. I don't want that. I think the more diversity, the better. But the hypocrisy is really unfair when you think about the native animals are going to die. Because you just look at the, the eucalyptus and you see the eagles, both species prefer eucalyptus. The hummingbirds eat from them. So many animals live in them. And then at the last meeting, there was this maniac carrying on about the eucalyptus. And they'll come on the sites and they'll say nothing lives from them. And, and you proved all the plants that do so well. So I just wanted to add, and I just, anyway, I love seeing the pictures and all the creatures living on the non-native hated plants. Uh, well, yes, yeah, you know, a lot of times people don't understand why I'm showing all these pictures mm -hmm. of these things using the plants, but uh, yeah, you guys get it. And I gotta say, you're all way ahead of me on eucalyptus. I really love the work that's being done, like the Million Trees website. Oh, they're that fantastic. Is stellar, I mean, uh, because, yeah. You know, I, I can only do so much. What? Yeah, they're wonderful. Um, well, I just wanted to add, I just found out yesterday that the Pinus sabiana, that's the gray pine, ghost pine, foothill pine, has many names, that's sort of in the inland areas, it's at Mount Diablo, Sinol, Pinnacles, it's dying. I don't know if they're all dying, but it's doing really bad from the drought. So one more reason to not kill any non-native that's doing well. You know, we know the other trees may be going. And when I talked to East Bay Regional Parks person out there killing euphorbia a few weeks ago, and, and first he's like, the oaks will come in and take over where the beautiful pines are and they want to kill them. And I'm like, the oaks are all going to die. He said, well, then it'll just be bay trees. Well, won't that be nice? I mean, nothing but fairly short, dark trees with no diversity. So. That, that are also <laughs> very flammable. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. I love bay trees. Uh, the, the nuts, if you prepare them cor yeah. correctly, are delicious. So. Uh, but we need that diversity. Yeah, so thank we need you it. so much. And the Nazi connection. Oh, I had an aunt who was sterilized in the eugenics program in the 30s because she was considered a criminal at the age of 16, being poor. And um, yeah. people don't realize the Nazis got the idea from. Henry right. Laughlin in the U.S. who started it. Exactly, exactly. And I just read an article that like several hundred women in the California prison system have recently been sterilized without proper authorization. Mm -hmm. So the, the, these things just keep turning up like bad pennies. Yeah, it's great talk. Next person. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, um, David, would you advocate uh, direct action in lying when we go through agricultural inspection when we enter the state of California, or would you advocate uh, political action to close those um, inspection ports? You know, that, that's really interesting. A lot of times I've been challenged on this, and people say that, well, would you advocate spreading of pests? And I'm saying, look, there's seven billion people in the world. We have to feed them. There are legitimate agricultural quarantines, even though they're actually in the minority, if you look at the lists in uh, the, the California laws. Uh, yeah, let's not make, I mean, I, I work with, I mean, I'm a rural guy myself. I work with farmers and ranchers. Let's not make it any harder on them than it is, you know. Oh, and direct action, yeah. Uh, you know, I. I I'm, I'm totally unqualified as far as uh, dealing with uh, political activism. It's just not my field. I would defer to the experts on what's going to be effective and what won't be. Uh, you know, like I said, hey, it's Bastille Day. I mean, <laughs> I'd love to see massive direct action worldwide, but uh, until that happens, I guess I just have to wait. Thank you. I wanted to say I was quite impressed I see very little good, if any, uh, in this uh, native plant nonsense. And I also feel that uh, this native plant stuff always smelled like racism, and you've convinced me it is. But I also want to say, I think there's a whole bunch of money being made somehow, and we need to look into the contracts. I bet there's more than one contract. Monsanto is real good at not only... Um, making things that cause cancer, but they also make cancer medicines. So cancer is a business opportunity for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd love 
to hear if you have anything to say about the Scotch broom, because this is just... Uh, yeah, you know. if I had known there were going to be <laughs> Scotch broom defenders here, I would have brought my broom, uh, the broom part of my paper. Uh, yeah, that was one of the ones I first got started on. In fact, it was one of the plants that first, when I was like in high school, I think, that I, I first noticed that people were saying, oh, broom is bad, broom is bad. And then I know, in, in high school, I noticed, well, the broom is growing in disturbed habitats like roadsides. It didn't invade elsewhere. And then later on, uh, I started observing in stands of broom. Now, they're pretty complex. Uh, there's a number of species involved. Uh, and they're also hybridizing, so we have evolution in action. But you'll find the same sort of thing. Uh, insects and bees using the flowers. You'll find uh, little middens from the uh, you know, local crescented rodents uh, eating the seeds, uh, rabbits uh, stripping part of the bark, the deer uh, browse on them. Uh, yeah, th th they are integrating. Uh, that <clears throat> yeah, that's the key thing is that in nature, Ecosystems are, are accustomed to receiving new species, and species are, are accustomed to moving around. In fact, there's a theory in evolutionary biology now that almost all species are invaders, and, it, and the invasion, a, a species will evolve in a certain locality, and then it must invade or disperse to other areas in order to survive. So, uh, yeah, they, it, it's just like, uh, you know, human beings. You know, I could move to uh, Bangladesh or uh, Moscow okay. or any other place in the world and I could make myself a useful citizen. Well, we have another question over here. What about Spartina? Uh, Spartina. That's interesting because it's uh, native to the East Coast and it's come here. It supports high uh, populations of a number of uh, native insects. Uh, it could be stabilizing in the face of uh, ocean, the ocean oceans rising because of climate change. Uh, I, this woman I work with up in uh, southern Washington has an organic uh, oyster farm, and she had her. They were ex exterminating the Spartina all around Willapa Bay, and uh, they they sprayed her organic o oyster farm, and she found that. Uh, her, her her oysters did better in the Spartina, so uh, it's just like an, anything else. A lot of times when I've argued with invasionists, they'll say, well, but what about this? But what about that? But what about that? And every time I go and do my homework, you go to the university libraries, you look up the articles in uh, the journals, and even the articles by invasionists, if you read the fine print, just like that one about the buckthorn, you find that things are not this you know, the, the, how, the, the, they're not how they're demonized, so. I, I wanna say one other thing personally too. I'm a fourth generation, not just California, but Bay Area native. Uh, and my mom back, I, I guess about 1990, um, I had this amazing conversation with her one night where she said to me that she just could not deal with the fact that it was any such year as 1990 because when she had been a little girl growing up in Oakland in the 1920s, the old people were prone to continually saying, ah, but that was back in the 90s before California was ruined. <laughs> So <laughs> it, it's not only that the natives have always been outnumbered, but the natives have always been saying that our, that our best days were behind us going back well over a century. So. Yeah, well, I would say our best days are ahead. <laughs> the, the, the planet rocks. Human beings can be really beautiful, wonderful creatures. You know, all we have to do is build that future. So, uh. Hi, I, I heard you mentioned cattle, but I didn't hear the beginning of that sentence, and I was unclear about whether you thought they were helpful, harmful, or where you stood on the effects of cattle. Oh, uh, cattle, in fact, uh, I have friends who are cattle ranchers. In fact, I just bought a half a split side of grass-fed beef from a gal I know up in, up in Northern California. Uh, cattle, it, it, just like any other species, like the slide I showed where there's wildflowers on one side of the fence and the cattle on the other, um, the harmful effects of cattle are 
uh, only from overstocking, I would say. It's like they're just another organism in the ecosystem. I mean, California had, remember, California had mammoths and mastodons. They, they would like root up grasses with their tusks and trample things. Uh, we, there were herds of elk that grazed. Uh, you know, most ecosystems have grazers. I mean, even aquatic ecosystems, there are herbivores that eat things. Cattle are, uh, they're, they're just another organism. It's like, uh, like uh, corn or wheat. They're just another organism, but they make, you know, this, the, you, you get these corn deserts. Those are artificial. It's from artificial stocking rates. So, and I definitely support uh, cattle ranchers. Uh, in fact, there have been studies showing that when they excluded cattle from uh, a spring in a field, that the biological diversity of the spring dropped. I mean, cattle, just like people, can, can be good citizens. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure you'll know the answer to this, but uh, do you know any particular relationship between the University of California and Monsanto, especially, say, UC Berkeley? I, yeah, I would bet there's funding. I know a gal who, uh, in fact, she worked on sequencing the genome of the Sudden Oak Death, and uh, she's at UC Davis, which is, of course, more agricultural, and she was telling me, I was, because I, 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 I was griping to some of my academic friends saying, look, you've got to stop this corruption, and she said, hey, if I don't accept Mont Monsanto funding, I won't have a program. So I, I, I can sympathize, but at some point, I think academics are going to have to stand up, bite the bullet, and uh, do what's right, even if, they, if their funding suffers. Uh, because uh, uh, remember in Cambodia when the Khmer Rouge like killed all the intellectuals and the teachers? And I remember thinking, why would a, a society kill all the smart people? You need the smart people. You need the educated people. But as long as academics continue to betray us into the hands of our oppressors, they're going to reap what they sow. Right, and state budget cuts enter in because the public universities are being decimated, so they have to turn to corporate support. Yeah, exactly. Kind of I don't know together. how we can get out of this death spiral we're in in that way, but uh, you know, maybe we need one of those catastrophic events, uh, like in an ecosystem, and then we start over. We just pu push uh, restart or whatever. Well, it's interesting because that my question is about catastrophic events, yeah. and um, I know the Native Americans practice control burns, and seems like I've read that fires are actually necessary for the health of an ecosystem. So, how does that apply to these urban forests? I mean, is there a way, should we be doing controlled burns? Or it seems like they, the fires are worse if there aren't controlled burns, but is that a possibility or what's, what's the solution to that? Well, that's a really interesting question because burning is controversial in ecology because uh, the, a lot of the botanists like these control burn, controlled burns, but some other like entomologists and mammologists call them pyrobotanists because they burn too often because it helps the plants, but it may uh, harm invertebrates. Uh, as far as urban forests, it's an urban setting. Uh, yeah, we can't have wildfires. Uh, a lot of these places, like I'm sure the eucalyptus forests, and a lot of places where we've had fire suppression for too long, there's been too much of a buildup of fuel, so we it would be very difficult to start a program of controlled burns. Uh, I don't know how you would go about that. You might have to do manual cutting uh, and uh, burning, but uh, it, uh, time, time is one way. We can't really go back. So, I mean, so how do you deal with that buildup of fuel since we since fire might not be a good option, but what well, do you do about okay, that? Well, okay, in an urban environment, it'll, it'll just have to be dealt with one way or another, whether you cut it and mulch it. Uh, there's a really interesting uh, technique that came out of this uh, renegade farmer in Austria. In fact, he, he holds the record of being fined by the uh, government for his farming practices, but he's actually way ahead of everyone else. He's organic, he's permacultural, and he's developed this method uh, it's called 
oogle culture where you, you, you cut woody material and you lay it in, uh, in rows, like wind rows, along the uh, uh, le a lot level, along a hilly landscape, along the, uh, the pardon? Topography. Yeah, 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 you know what I mean. Uh, and then you bury it, and, that, and then you plant on that. And then that way it sequesters carbon, the buried wood helps, and the berm helps retain moisture in, in the landscape and replenish the, uh, the water table. But again, that's a really, it's a uh, uh, labor intensive thing and you usually have to use heavy equipment. And it looks really ugly at first, but uh, yeah, I honestly don't know because we've had fire suppression for so long uh, like the forest where I live, outside of La Honda, in the, I've been there for like 36, 37 years, and I've watched it change from sort of an open oak savanna with a lot of grassland, and now it's dominated by dug fir, and a lot of people have come and said, well, look, you've got to cut down all these seedling dug firs, and I go, well, I can thin them for fire, but then if I cut them all down, and then, I, like people have pointed out, if we lose the oaks to sudden oak death, then I won't have anything. So, uh, I don't know. In fact, I should also mention about the uh, dug firs. They talk about eucalyptus toppling. Let me tell you, dug firs let go, and these I've had 150 foot tall dug firs just topple in these heavy, in heavy rains and wind. I don't know if I answered your question, I'm rambling. So what are some other ways we could integrate integration biology into our lives? Uh, I think it's just a matter of, uh, like, take to, in your heart, you know, have a heartfelt relationship with all living beings. I mean, I remember Darwin said that uh, a disinterested love in all living beings is the most noble attribute of man. And... Uh, you know, Native Americans often talk about all of our relations. Uh, it's like you first you put fear out of your heart and you start respecting all living beings and then you're able to see more clearly. If you've ever heard of blind hatred or blind fear, uh, once you get the fear out of your mind, then you can see things like the wild bees on the uh, star thistle. Uh, and also push academics to start to clean up their act. I mean, you know, the, the extreme language that I showed at the beginning of my talk, you find the same stuff in, you know, peer-reviewed science, which is one indication that it ain't science. Uh, let's see. Oh, you know, another thing I could mention, they always talk about the native grasses, the native bunch grasses being deep-rooted, so they... Uh, you know, they retain water in the landscape, they stay green longer. That's exactly what star thistle does. Star thistle is amazing. It sends down these meter long tap roots. And because it's an annual, every, that, that root sequesters carbon and when it eventually decays, it forms a channel to allow rainwater to penetrate more deeply into the ecosystem. It's star thistle, it's healing the land. I, w I want to mention something else just to bring it into a little this is a very it, this is all very complex and some of you probably picked up some ideas and facts tonight that you had no idea were swirling around so a lot of it is very complex some of it is quite simple some of this is all just about money and contracts and here's a case in point San Leandro Creek over a hundred years ago eucalyptus was intentionally uh, intentionally planted specifically to hold the banks. It has, like the eucalyptus has done a magnificent job doing that, and then there's the rest, it, raptors, it's, it's incredible, you can't even believe you're in, the, I live in San Leandro, you can't even believe you're in that otherwise concrete city when you're um, around the creek. Um, however, a plan, you know, came into place um, and it was all behind closed doors until it was on people, until suddenly people in this neighborhood started seeing people with clipboards hanging around and looking at the trees and whatever. Long story short, um, the county water uh, organization had not been doing any kind of 
uh, management at all. There was wild, so-called wildfire danger created in the creek, but that was just mismanagement. That was just mismanagement of absolutely no work being done. So there were fire ladders everywhere. Well, what's the answer by the county? Oh, there's fire danger, so now we have to cut down all the trees, right? And use pesticides in the creek um, and, and all that. Um, well, you know, it turned out that there were contractors just lined up around the block, practically, you know, ready to take those contracts to cut the trees. And they, their whole plan was based on the quickest and easiest way to slap them all down and drag them all out in this one little area. Um, so, you know, some of that's been held off, but some of those trees have been taken down. But it was in the neighborhood where the, the people yelled the loudest, where they yelled the loudest and they didn't fall prey to... You know, some people are saying, well, we've got to be really quiet and, and, and work with the county. They didn't understand what they were actually seeing. That was on paper, you know. They didn't understand that there really was, you know, all this gross mismanagement and that the whole thing was based on not doing any, you know, not doing what one would expect the agency to have been doing over the last decades in just basic fire ladder management of the understory you know, when it's right up against homes. And, um, and it was about people being set to make a lot of money off of it. So sometimes it isn't actually really complex. Sometimes it really is just about business. And it really is awful. And we can never forget that some people will do anything for money. And within the whole world of pesticides and these statewide programs, glass wing sharpshooter, medfly, and everything, oh, there are state doctors, Dr. Peter Kurtz, he's been, a, he's been repeatedly sort of on the rolls and out there speaking publicly, confusing people about pesticides, making people feel like pesticide use can be safe. Um, you can always find somebody who will try to tell you pesticides are safe, try to tell you it's a great idea to clear cut, everything in sight, etc. You can find those people, so we just, we have to make sure that we keep bringing up the facts, and I find it very useful when people do the knee jerk, oh, we gotta get rid of the eucalyptus, because, you know, yeah, I'm fine with getting rid of the eucalyptus. You know, yesterday, in the farmer's market and outside of the cheese board, I was flyering for this event, and I had people say, oh, are you talking about the eucalyptus? And I said, well, all the eucalyptus and the Monterey pines and acacia, not all, but you know, about a half a million of them in the hills. Um, and people said, well, I don't care about the eucalyptus, they're a fire danger. And I said, why do you say that? And of course, not a one of them could say exactly why they said that. They're like, well, that's what I've heard. And I said, I know. But why don't you come to the program um, or go to the websites and actually learn the facts? So asking that question and putting people on the spot in a nice way, we don't have to be, you know, rude or rabid or anything, but, you know, asking people to explain why they say that, it's kind of effective, I think, in getting people to kind of open their minds. Are there any more so, questions or comments? You know, there's that expression, it can't happen here. It really can't happen here. Uh, one of the purposes of this program is to educate people and, and make people aware of what's happening. And uh, every major movement that I know of, whether it was Earth First or Occupy or whatever, just started with a few people. <clears throat> and you are some of the few people. And you can reach five to ten people and, and share what you learned tonight. And we can grow and uh, uh, really... Uh, create a great action to stop this this further abuse of um, the environment. So thanks for educating us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for listening. I guess uh, if I could just make a couple of final comments, things I probably should have said at the beginning. Uh, I think the wise, three wisest words I've ever heard are, I don't know. And I... Sh I should caution everybody that everything I've told you tonight is pretty much mostly based on peer-reviewed scientific literature, but that can often be wrong. And so I'll, I'm not saying I'm right about this stuff. I, I would hope that I am less wrong than, than some other points of view. So uh, yeah, just be skeptical of everything and, and check test everything I've said. Uh, I don't know, anything else to cover? 
else other than uh, um, the knit in was mentioned before. Uh, my kids and I helped to start Occupy Berkeley. Several people here were part of Occupy Berkeley and the encampment. The knit in is a, basically a cultural exchange program, one might say. It's a beautiful project. Um, the third Saturdays of the month, it's this next Saturday at. Um, the park right by the Farmer's Market in Berkeley. And we have a lovely website that was put together by one of the knitters showing what we've done, like to send to activists and others around the world who are working for justice all around the world, Newfoundland and Tahrir Square and Fukushima and Walmart workers in Seattle and uh, the Midwife Education Project in Nicaragua. Uh -huh.